Good morning. How's everybody today? Good. We've got, uh, hey, we had some rain today. How, how many of you got rain this morning? Yeah, all right. Good job. Hey, I'll tell you what, Lord is blessed, and I, I woke up and heard thunder rumbling, and I thought, ooh, thank you, Jesus. I was praising the Lord before I got, ever got out of bed. So uh, we just continue that on today, praising the Lord, because he's given us so many blessings. Start things off with Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 through 9. It says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of, the, of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the poor who are outcast into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth as the morning and your healing shall spring forth quickly and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your reward. Then you shall call and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he shall say, here I am. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For the day, thank you that you are here for us, Lord. Help us to just to to live our lives in a way that brings you glory and honor and praise. That others would see your grace in us. That others would see uh, the compassion that that you build into the lives of those who put their faith and trust in you, Lord. That they would see our our goodness and our graciousness and and all of that and seeing all of that in us. That they would see Jesus. Lord, I just pray that you would help us in our worship this morning to truly worship you. And if there's anything that would hinder that, that you get it out of the way so we can just come before you with open hearts and lift your name in praise. Please be with those that are on our hearts where there's so many suffering with COVID and other issues. And we just lift them up to you and pray that you'd have your will and your way in each situation. And through it all, you'd be glorified. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand together. We are going to sing this morning. I... I uh, love these songs we've got this morning. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And uh, let everybody get in place. All right, ready? Here we go. And one, two. Oh, wait, we got to get the choir in here. I thought the choir was already behind me. Come on, choir, come on. Yeah. I looked up. So just like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I, I, was, I saw them come in place, and I'm used to y'all coming in the other direction. And so, yeah, so anyway. All right, here we go. Here we go. And one, two, three, four. song we could ever see worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus the name jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Jesus Christ. That is a firm foundation. We, we, we use these terms kind of flippantly, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. We learned that as a kid, right? I mean, you do all this stuff, and we kind of go on thinking, oh yeah, we've, we've, I'll build my house, you know, my life upon the rock, yeah, oh, Jesus is the rock, and all these things. That we, we use these terms really flippantly, but do you realize what that really means? When we can truly build our entire lives, our families, our careers, our church, our friendships, everything on this foundation that's not shakable. That, so that when things like pandemics hit, it doesn't completely undo us. And you, you watch this world just fall apart and everybody running in every direction, not knowing where to go. And yet you've got those who are have their faith and their trust in Jesus are still just steady and say, well, I don't know where the Lord's going with this, but I trust the Lord. I know he's going to take care of us. And that's that firm foundation that we have. And that's all that we really need. And this morning, it, when we talk about giving up stuff and setting things aside and even letting go of things, you know, we've had to let go of some things as a church. We've had to let go of things as a, as a family. Things are not the same, and they're not going to be the same. We'll never be the same after this pandemic. We've had to let go of stuff. And sometimes we willingly let go of things just so we can have a closer relationship with Christ. And those things should never shake us because Jesus Christ is enough. He's all we'll ever need. Let's sing it together. Christ is enough. Turning back. 
Peter said it best, Lord, to whom would we go? There's nowhere else to go. So we'll just follow him. How's that? Where he leads me, I will follow. I discovered, I've been here for nine years, and this was not in any of the folders for the choir or anything. After nine years, we have never sang this song here since I've been here. And I thought, well, well, that's a shame. Let's sing it today. Where he leads me, I will follow. I can hear my Savior calling. Go ahead, Lord, you can give us a lead. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads.
here together. As a family, we join hands together, lifting praises to the Father above for sending His Son. We chosen together as a family. Grab your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 6. While you're turning there, I have a question for you. So this is just a, uh, I'd like to take a uh, poll, if you will, to start our sermon. Uh, in your memory, can you uh, remember sitting in church uh, services on a Sunday morning, 
and listening to a sermon about the topic of fasting. Could I get a hand if you've heard the topic of fasting preached? Okay, I've got about six people. That's why we're not skipping verses 15 through 18 of Matthew 6. That's why I needed to study it, and that's why we need to cover it, because uh, we need to deal with this passage. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. How many of y'all did not have breakfast this morning? Okay, good. So those of you who haven't had breakfast, consider it a fast because we're going right through lunch. <laughs> You're not eating till supper. So it's a mandatory fast. Yeah, I heard that back there. Yeah. Well, actually, Brother Sean and I were discussing this topic. We, we, about a, probably about three weeks ago, we were discussing where we were headed in the next month, month and a half of sermons in worship. And, and I had already preached uh, kind of an overview sermon of this passage and covered verses 16 through 18. And at the time when we were talking, I said, you know, I think I'm just going to move on from that. I don't want to spend another, pa- another week in uh, this, this section of Scripture. And Brother Sean said, well, and I, I don't know the exact quote, but it was something along like this. He said, well, you know, we read this passage and I don't know about everyone else, but we all wonder, um, are we supposed to do this? Like, you, you read the passage, it's in red. And you go, when you fast, and you just kind of keep going. Oh, we don't do that. I don't think, do we? And then we just kind of move on and forget about that passage and those statements. In fact, he went on to say he's not sure he'd ever heard a sermon in a Sunday morning service on the topic of fasting. And, uh, and as a full gospel preacher, I can attest to you that I, I don't uh, often preach on it. Uh, so this is why we need to study this passage, and this is why I needed to study it, and why we need to spend some time on it together. Let's read our text. Matthew chapter 6 says, verse 16, Moreover, when you fast. So in this section, remember, Jesus is covering three of the biggest outward shows of piety and, and, and religion and righteousness. How you give to others, you give to poor people, your almsgiving, your public and private prayer life. And now he's going to deal with their fasting. Because fasting was a big part of Hebrew culture in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament times. So Jesus says, moreover, what's the next word? Somebody say it out loud. ruh <laughs> We're going to circle back to this. When you fast, not if... So Jesus is assuming that his kingdom people that he's preaching to, his disciples, will what? Fast. Hmm, okay, that's uncomfortable. I may have already lost you. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, they mar their faces, they they may even put uh, signs of, of mourning, maybe put some ash on their face. And they do this that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, amen, I say to you, they have their reward. If you fast to be seen of men, Jesus says, that is what you will get. You will get your reward from that. Verse 17, but you, what's the next word? When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Clean up, smell good. It's a normal day. Shave. Shave. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us today to deal with a a subject we don't normally spend a lot of time on. But Father, it's in your word, and uh, we claim to believe your word. And so help us to understand what your text, what your Bible is teaching us, what Jesus is teaching us. Help us to be kingdom people and followers of Jesus. And Father, we ask you to search our hearts, not just our minds this morning. Help us to bring you an offering of worship and praise as we serve and worship you. Help us to choose right now in this moment as we spend this time around your word to worship and serve you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... So Jesus' teaching in verses 16 through 18 is very straightforward. He says, don't fast like, like the hypocrites. Don't, don't fast like someone who is in the theater. John Stott puts it this way. The, the religious people, of the, the Pharisees of those days, the hypocrite performs his rituals or his religion in order to be seen by men. They're in a theater giving a performance. Jesus said, don't serve God that way, whether you're giving alms, whether you're praying, or whether you're fasting. 
The religion like that is a public spectacle. They're somber and sad faced. They're disfigure and mar their faces. They're dark, dour, sad, and sullen. And the purpose is so that they would be seen by men. And Jesus is simply very straightforward and clear. If that's why you fast, that's your only reward. Now, the Old Testament prophets condemned this kind of fasting. Uh, we read uh, part of Isaiah 58 to begin the service. Read the whole chapter. Because Jesus, uh, the, the Old Testament, God is talking about how they were fasting, but God wasn't hearing their prayers because their fasting was just an outward show. It was just hypocrisy. Because while they were fasting from their food, they wouldn't share what they had with the poor. And while they were fasting on the Sabbath, they were making their workers work. <laughs> Jeremiah 14 is also a condemnation of this kind of pharisaical uh, hypocrisy and, and fasting. Jesus says, though, however, to us, his followers, when you fast, and there it is in verses 16 and 17, not if, but when you fast, followers of Jesus fast, kingdom people fast. He says, anoint your head, wash your face, get cleaned up, freshen up. The point is that so that when you fast, no one can look at your appearance and know what you're doing. Okay? He's not saying that people can't know that you're fasting because obviously if you're fasting lunch and somebody invites you out and they want to know why you're not eating, it's okay to tell them. But the motive of our heart is not to be seen by men, but rather the motive of our heart is to serve, to fast as worship and service to God, to do it privately, to do it purposefully. Because, according to Jesus, look at these words. Before you, before you make a judgment about whether or not you will ever fast, I want you to see what Jesus says. Verse 18. Your father who is in, in the secret place, your father who sees in secret will what? Reward you openly. So what we do privately is worship and service to the Lord our Father, who we can't see, sees that secret, private worship, purposeful worship, and he rewards it openly. Okay, that's it. Great to see y'all. Have a great Labor Day. See y'all later. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, here's the problem with this passage. Jesus is assuming in this passage that you and I have a biblical, a broad and deep biblical understanding of fasting. The people of his day did. We don't. And so we've got to actually back up and define what fasting actually is to even begin to apply this passage. So when we, whenever we talk about fasting, let's just look at some definitions very quickly. A definition of fasting. These are from different uh, Bible dictionaries. And some of these uh, later on will be kind of my uh, definition. But definition of fasting is the laying aside of food for a period of time as the believer seeks to know God in a deeper experience. Next, next definition. Fasting is deliberate and often prolonged abstinence from food and sometimes drink. There are all sorts of fasts in the Old and New Testament. All sorts of lengths. One day, three days, 40 days just during the day, but you can eat in the evening. There's all sorts of different types of durations and links and also purposes. Keep going. Definition of fasting, a ritual of abstaining from food and or drink for a predetermined period of time and usually a sign of mourning. So whenever you see, especially in the Old Testament, it, sometimes it's a mourning over death. Maybe it's a mourning over sin in the, in the kingdom of Israel. It's a mourning and it's a time to be empty of ourselves and to be hungry, indicating that we are repenting and bothered. Okay? Because I don't know about you, when I miss, I get hangry. Right? When we miss a meal, we get hungry and it bothers us physically. It's supposed to. Fasting is supposed to cost us something. Okay, so if, if this is what you think fasting is, fasting means I skip lunch and then I'm going to eat a giant meal at night. You're not fasting. That's like saying I'm fasting from TV, but I've DVR'd everything, and next weekend I'll watch everything I missed. You didn't fast anything. You didn't give anything up. You just moved it over to a different day. <laughs> you with me? So fasting, we, we abstain from food or drink for a predetermined period of time. It's a sign of mourning. Look at, look at the next. The, the, the Old Testament Hebrew word 
in the Day of Atonement in Leviticus uh, 16 and Leviticus chapter 23 that is the only passage in the Old Testament where fasting is commanded. Okay? That word that they use to describe fasting is self-denial. It means to afflict yourself, to humble yourself, deny yourself. And all of those days in the Old Testament, those days when they would come at the Passover, the Feast of the Tabernacles, those were all festivals. But one day a year they would come and they would fast on the Day of Atonement and before. That was the only time they fasted as they celebrated the covering and the giving of that sacrifice for sin. In the New Testament, the, the, sometimes the Bible is just really clear. I, I dug deep into the Greek to understand what the word fasting meant in the Greek. You know what it means? It means you're empty. <laughs> it means you're not eating. <laughs> that's exactly what it means. Nothing more, uh, nothing more special than that. But that's what it means. One who has not eaten and is empty. And just, just, just as an aside, this is extra. So the Day of Atonement was supposed to teach the Old Testament Israelites about the coming Day of Atonement where Jesus would die for our sins, right? And he would give an atoning sacrifice for sins. And they were supposed to empty themselves and then rest and do nothing it was a complete sabbath they didn't eat and they didn't work what a picture of new testament faith in jesus when you come to christ by faith you're coming to the cross empty hungry in need but you don't work for it you just rest in it Beautiful picture of salvation in the Old Testament. So we have this, uh, these two definitions of fasting. Let's, let's keep uh, going through this. By the way, we're going through a lot of material on fasting. Get, it, get ready. You ready for a really bad joke? We're going to go really fast. All right. So now when you read the Old Testament, you, thank you, Mike. Duncan, that was, that was a joke just for you because you came all the way from the great northeast to here. Thank you. All right. When you look at fasting in the Old and New Testament, fasting is most often a response to something. Now, it's not always a response, but almost always it's a response to a calamity like Job's situation. It's a response to sin that has been exposed by the preaching of a prophet. Remember Nathan and David in Psalm 51, Psalm 35, where David says, I, I, I fasted and made my knees weak. <laughs> Uh, so, sometimes it was a, a, a cry for help and deliverance when Ezra was taking the Babylonian captives back to Israel. He fasted and prayed before he left because he needed God to protect him. So a lot of times in the Bible, fasting is a response, not necessarily a means to something. So don't always think of, of, of oh, I need to fast so I can become a better Christian. Actually, fasting comes out of the Christian life as a normal expression, or it should. Okay, so fasting is most often a response, not a means. Now, whenever, uh, keep, keep rolling, we're still defining fasting. So when we fast, we are saying no, we're saying no to normal fleshly needs. We're saying no to normal human needs or desires, food, water. In fact, Paul even mentions that we can fast from intimacy with our spouses if we give ourselves to prayer and fasting and so when you look at saying no to our fleshly needs and no to our human needs what are we saying yes to whenever we say no to our human need we're saying yes to God's will fasting is always associated with saying no to ourselves and yes to the will and the work and the kingdom of God it's associated always with prayer. It's always associated with worship and sacrifice. It is always focused on spiritual purposes. So before we go any further, if you are practicing fasting to lose weight, that is not what we're talking about. Okay, the intermittent fasting is very popular right now. There's nothing wrong with intermittent fasting. But that's for a physical purpose. That's for a blood sugar purpose. That's for, to, that's for you to control your weight or control your appetites. And while all those are good things, that's not a spiritual purpose. Fasting is, I am so consumed by a burden, by a problem, by a sin, by a circumstance that I am not going to eat and I'm going to seek God's face. I'm going to seek God's will and I'm going to pray and I'm going to stay here until I get an answer. That's fasting. And that's why we don't talk about it. Because <laughs> it's uncomfortable. <laughs> the primary goal of fasting is to seek God's will and God's wisdom and God's presence and God's protection. 
And while all those biblical definitions of fasting are good, it becomes even clearer uh, about fasting when you when we do an overview of fasting. So let me give you a, an overview of fasting. Now again, we're, we're going to go through all this information about fasting. How are we going to do it? Fast. Okay, you ready? Because th- this is a summary of everything I've learned this week about fasting. So let's talk about some people who fasted. Moses, you remember when he came down from the mountain and the Israelites were worshiping the golden calf and they broke the law, he broke the law and he had to go back up the mountain later? Well, the second time he went up to get the, the law from God, he stayed there 40 days and 40 nights without food and without water. Miraculous. 40 days, 40 nights, look it up yourself, Exodus chapter 34, without food, without water, in the presence of the Lord. He was so overwhelmed and filled by the presence of God that when he came down off the mountain, his face shone like the sun, and they had to put a bag on his head. That's a pretty good fast, huh? (laughs) Hannah fasted. She was supposed to be celebrating Passover. She was supposed to be celebrating with her, with her husband and with her family. But she was childless and she was embittered and burdened by the fact that she did not have a child. And she refused to have a feast. And she fasted and she prayed until God heard her prayer and gave her the son named Samuel. David fasted when Saul and his sons died. David fasted after his sin with Bathsheba, and he fasted while he was hoping that God might spare his son after that horrible sin. Daniel fasted for three weeks prior to the revelations given to him in Daniel 9 and Daniel 10, where God gave him incredible insight into the word and the will of God. Elijah fasted, another 40-day fast, miraculously sustained, because he didn't have food or water for 40 days. Ezra and Nehemiah, these are two men who helped build the nation of Israel after Babylonian captivity. Ezra prayed and fasted before he left. When he got back to the land, he prayed and fasted because all of the people who came back with him had intermarried pagan wives. And that sin broke him. Nehemiah, when he heard the news in the palace in Shushan, he heard the news of the broken walls. He stopped and he fasted and he prayed in brokenness over what God, over what sin had done to the walls of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah prayed and fasted when he ended up back in Jerusalem. Esther called for a fast whenever she went before the king. A three-day fast of no water, no bread, because of how serious the situation was. When you open the pages of the New Testament, we're introduced to Anna the prophetess, who stayed at the temple. She was a widow, and she served God continually. So what'd she do? She got up every day and she went to the temple and worshiped and served God every day. And it says, with prayers and fasting. This is what she did. And she was allowed to see the Messiah, Jesus Christ, with her own eyes. John the Baptist fasted. That crazy, redneck, wild-eyed prophet fasted and so did his followers. In fact, later we're going to look at the passage where Jesus is accused of not fasting. We're going to look at that in just a second. Paul fasted. He lists multiple fasts in different passages. There are also groups of people who fasted in the Old Testament. Israel fasted when they fought against Benjamin in Judges chapter 20. Israel fasted as a country led by the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Whenever the whole country was under siege, the southern kingdom was under siege, all of Jerusalem, all of Judea, all of the southern kingdom under Jehoshaphat's leadership, fasted and prayed for deliverance. Whenever the exiles traveled from Babylonian back to Israel, they fasted and prayed for protection in Ezra 8. Get this, even Gentiles fasted. Remember Jonah? Who'd he go preach to? The Ninevites. He went through the city preaching and they repented. And one of the signs of their repentance fasting a bunch of gentiles heard the word of god and because of their sin and their repentance they stopped eating because it got their attention wow (laughs) the church at antioch in the new testament fasted regularly and fasted when they set aside paul and barnabas to be first the first missionaries sent out by that church 
As Paul and Barnabas went out on their first mission trip in Acts 14, the Gentile churches fasted and prayed as they set aside elders and pastors in each of those churches. Now, in the Old Testament, there's only one commanded fast, and that's the fast on the Day of Atonement. And as I said, this was a fast and not a feast. All the other days of worship were feasts, but this was a fast because of what it signified. There are also three uh, long-term fasts, two of which are miraculous. Moses, 40 days, 40 nights without water. We know, doctor, right, can you verify 40 days without water? It would have to be miraculous to be sustained like that. But I guess if a human being standing in the presence of God, you might not need so much water, right? So how's that possible? I remember a guy, I remember when I was uh, preaching uh, in, uh, the, in, in Mercer one time, and there was a guy that... Uh, well, he would listen to my sermons, but he, he, he always had trouble with the miraculous. And so he read this passage on his own. He said, how's that possible? And I said, it's not. It's just not possible. He said, see, I told you, the Bible's just full of lies. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not possible for us, but it's possible for the Lord. Likewise, Elijah, 40-day fast. Jesus, a 40-day fast before, he, and, before and during his temptation with Satan. And remember the first thing Jesus said. Remember the first words Jesus said. What came out of his mouth? As a man, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's word is more important than food. Moses said it. Jesus said it. Hmm. Wow. Wow. In addition to the Day of Atonement, it's also interesting, the Jews added extra fasts. <laughs> and they actually added four extra fasts that are covered in Zechariah 7 and Zechariah 8. And they commemorated some of the most ugly and difficult times of Israel's history. They were fasts of mourning, their failures. And they fasted on those days. And in Jesus' day, all of those fasts would have been practiced in addition to private fasts and public fasts. So even though the New Testament never commands us to fast, if you read the Bible, you see in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the people of God are found fasting. You can't run from the data. It's like, well, I believe the Bible. Well, you're just going to have to believe this because it's there. So whenever you, whenever you read this passage, all of these passages, that leads to obviously the next question is this. Should we fast today? Because that's really what you're wanting to know. Should I, as a Christian, should we as a church fast? Should we follow the example of Jesus and Paul and the early church? Should we follow the example of many Christians throughout the last 2,000 years of Christian history? Great. I mean, have y'all ever heard of Jerry Falwell? Fasted one day a week, every week of his ministry. Every week of his ministry, he fasted one day a week. Now, the Bible doesn't say to do that. That's what God led him to do, right? Adrian Rogers, have y'all heard of him? Fasted, often, privately, behind the scenes. Okay? So, the question is, should we fast today? Well, first of all, we need to understand something. And this is where it's going to get really confusing for us. Fasting is commended, but it's not commanded. So, throughout the pages of the Bible... When you fast for the right reasons, for the right purposes, God commends that. He sees it. Jesus said if you do it privately and purposefully, God will reward it openly. Right? So it's commended. It's just not commanded. So if you're, uh, if you're really tied up and get bound in knots about uh, whether or not there's actually a rule for this, it's like, well, if there's a rule, I can follow it, but if there's not a rule, I just I don't know what to do. There's no rule. It's commended, but it's not commanded. So what that means is fasting is, next slide, fasting is voluntary, not compulsory. Wait, wait a minute. Okay, so what you're telling me is all of these examples and what the Bible's teaching, God puts it out in front of us, and I can do it if I want. Yep. And if I don't want to, I don't have to. That's right. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because <laughs> you want me to tell you, you know, right now you're wanting me to tell you, you should fast. 
of all the people in this church house, you need you need some sackcloth. You need you need to not show. You need to fast. Okay. You, I mean, that's what you're wanting me to tell you, but I can't because that's not how this works. It's commanded, not it's commended, not commanded. It's voluntary, not compulsory. But when you come to Matthew chapter six, fasting is expected. It's assumed, and this is where it gets uncomfortable. Jesus says it twice in Matthew 6. When you fast. Says it again in verse 17. But you, when you fast. He's very emphatic, even in the original language. He says, but you, when you fast. So what do you do with that? Well, it's the word of Jesus, right? And as far as we can tell, this is a passage that is for us. In fact, Look over at Matthew chapter, just go over in Matthew chapter 9, just a couple of pages. I'm making this so easy on you. Fasting is hard enough. I'm going to make this easy for you to get there. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. So one of the funny thing, one of the interesting things about this, even though Jesus expected his followers to fast, when Jesus was here on the earth, you know what his disciples didn't do? They didn't fast. So John the Baptist and his disciples, they fasted. Jesus and his apostles didn't fast. So there was a problem. And if you look in verse 14, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? So this is a regular part of our duties before God. But your disciples do not fast. Jesus, you got some explaining to do. Jesus said to him, to them, and he uses the idea of a, a marriage. Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Now, who's in this illustration, who's the bridegroom? Jesus is the bridegroom, right? And the friends are those disciples and those apostles, right? And the bridegroom was with the wedding party. You with me? Jesus says, look, now I want you to get this because this is important. The disciples of John were asking this question, why is it different? Here's why it's different, Jesus says. I am the Messiah. I'm here. You don't need to mourn. The kingdom of God has come. You don't need to fast. Just come and be with me. That's what Jesus is saying in this passage. It's time for a festival. The kingdom of God is here. It's not just near. It's here. It's with me. Jesus is making a claim to his kingship in this passage. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. And it, and it, and it takes us into the future. Look, there's not going to be fasting in heaven, in the new heaven, in the new earth. Why? Because we will be filled forever. But here's the, here's the interesting thing. Look at what Jesus says. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. What are they going to do? They'll fast. So here's why fasting is appropriate for a New Testament Christian. It's different than the Day of Atonement fast in the Old Testament. Why? Because the Day of Atonement has been fulfilled. We stand here after the cross, after the resurrection of Jesus. We stand here filled with the Holy Spirit. We stand here with joy and thankfulness for what Jesus has done. But there's one problem. We're not home yet. And Jesus isn't here. Now, I mean, he's here through the Holy Spirit, and he lives in us. Don't get me wrong. He hasn't abandoned us, but he is not here, here. His kingdom hasn't fully come. I mean, you do know we're not home yet. You do, not, you do know that home is not filled with COVID. You do know that home is not filled with racial strife and unrighteousness. You know that home is not filled with a $30 trillion debt and a bunch of unthankful people. <laughs> We're not home yet, folks. We're in a place of disease and disaster. And Jesus isn't here fully. And so you know what? It's appropriate that sometimes we might just skip a meal or two. As we look that future kingdom that's coming. Waiting on Jesus to show up. We fast because we hunger and long to be filled with the presence of Jesus. If you back up into the book of Matthew, just before the, just before the uh, 
Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 4. Two passages, I think, frame fasting for us in the, own, in the words of Jesus. In verse, four, or verse 1 of chapter 4, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Have we ever missed a meal because we just couldn't shut our Bible? Have we ever missed a meal because we needed to wrestle something to the ground with God? With our Bibles open and our mouths open in worship and prayer, fasting for an answer, for understanding, for wisdom, for deliverance. Because the most important thing isn't to make sure you get three squares. The most important thing is the word and the will of God. In fact, when Jesus talks about his kingdom people in Matthew chapter 5, look at how he describes what we're supposed to be coming. What we are in him and what we're supposed to be coming like. He says, blessed are those who what? Hunger. And thirst. Now please understand what he's saying. He's not saying someone who's a little hungry or a little thirsty. He's saying, blessed are those who are dying of hunger. Blessed are those who are dying of thirst. But it's not for food. What's it for? Righteousness. You want to set aside a meal to seek God's kingdom? You know what God will do? According to Jesus, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be what? Filled up. Here's the hard truth. I'm exactly where I am in my experience of God here on this earth by my own choice. So, I, you know, if God would just, no, 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 no. <laughs> He's waiting on us, folks, to give him more and more of ourselves over to ourselves. The fact that we fast so little is only evidence that we don't hunger and thirst for his righteousness. Are we really desperate for it? And maybe we're really asking the wrong question. So when we ask the question, must we fast? We've turned delight and worship and service to God into duty. Give me the rules, I'll I'll write the check, I'll show up at church, I'll read the verses, I'll get it done. I, you know, Whatever I have to do, I just got to get it done. And then I can say, I'm a good Christian, I've done my thing, I've checked the boxes, I've done those things, I've done my duty. Do you understand that the Sermon on the Mount, the whole Sermon on the Mount, takes that kind of thinking and just goes, Whoa. He's not after our duty. He is after our devotion. He's after your love. Now don't get me wrong. Doing what you should is a good discipline. You should pray. You should read your Bible. But it will be empty and unfulfilling and unrewarded if your heart isn't in the middle of it. God is after your devotion. So we take up an offering every week and we talk about the offering that has come in and we put a number on it, right? Right? Let me make sure you understand something. We can have a full coffer. We can be debt free and not register an offering in heaven with any of it. If our hearts are not there. So well, I gave my, now you, you tell me not to give. No, I'm saying when you give your money, you are to give your heart. That's what he's after. And that's why this is an uncomfortable passage. <laughs> maybe we should ask, if, if we refuse to fast, instead of asking, must I fast, maybe we should ask, if I refuse to fast or choose not to fast, what might I miss? It's not that God's going to be angry with you. It's not commanded, right? I mean, listen to me. It's not commanded. But if God's leading you to do it, and that's if, and you refuse it, instead of saying, do I have to, ask this question. What might I miss if I refuse to follow the Lord in this? Jesus is clear. 
in Matthew 6 and also in Matthew 5, that private, purposeful fasting will be rewarded by the Father. Jesus said that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Now I'm going to go into more detail about the, the specifics of fasting and how we might go about doing that on a personal level or corporate level as a church. I'm going to do that later this week, hopefully in the Wednesday update. But let me close by asking one final question. Why is this passage and this topic so uncomfortable? I mean, why did I want to just go, bloop? Because <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I needed to study this. And you needed to hear it. The, the reason, the reason uh, and I, I hate to say this, but it's just the truth. We're just too legalistic. And we do not know how to live in the freedom that God's grace has given us. We're always asking, what do I have to do? Give me the rules, give me the rules, give me the rules. You know what Jesus said? If you love God and you love your neighbor, you fulfilled all the rules. Just love. Why well, Give me specifics. No, you figure that out. <laughs> Go before the Lord. Ask him what it means to love your neighbor. He'll show you. And it'll be messy. I remember one time I asked him, I, I, I need to love our neighbor at the church house. And man, it was a year and a half of just messy, messy, messy. <laughs> it was. <laughs> He'll answer that question for you. Don't turn something that's supposed to be a delight into duty. We do not have to fast. You do not have to fast. We are free not to fast, but we can. It's commended and it's voluntary. Secondly, one of the reasons why this is an uncomfortable passage is we're too easily satisfied. You know, as a Christian, once you kind of get past some of the big sins that churches don't like, like you figure out how to not do the big ones, and you, you, know, you figure out how to use the Christianese and you kind of fit in with all the churchy people, you know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what, you're, what I'm talking about, <laughs> go ask a neighbor because I'm mean, just telling you, that's, that's what we do. It's like, okay, well, I figured out how to stay in church and I don't do those things, so I'm, I'm okay. You see, we, we get just too satisfied with just being good church people. And I think sometimes we're too satisfied with, with, with that kind of living. We're too satisfied with our plenty. Our bellies are always full. That's, that's physically true. Ask Dr. Mike. The statistics are shocking over the last 25 or 30 years in America. We're not starving. We get satisfied with being a good Christian and we forfeit the, right, the opportunity to become men and women of God who wholeheartedly pursue his kingdom. Thirdly, we're also too distracted. We give up on things like prayer, Fasting, Bible reading, and Bible study because they are hard. You heard me say that. The hardest thing that you will do in your Christian life is consistently pray, consistently read the Bible, and consistently skip meals to do those two things. <laughs> those are hard things. But you see, we get, sad, we get so distracted because we want holiness and we want answers. God, I need to know an answer. And, and, and so we want an answer from God and we expect him to answer us like Google does in seconds. We want answers from God. We want his deliverance. We want his, him to come in and fix a certain situation, shape our heart, change our minds. And we want him to do it immediately like microwave popcorn. And I'm just telling you, it does not work that way. Because God will not give answers to people he can't trust the answers with. So when you see people fasting, I mean, Daniel fasted how long? Three weeks. And then God gave him insight. Well, why didn't he do it after a day? I don't know. Probably had something to do with Daniel's heart. When the Israelites were encamped against Benjamin, they had three battles. And they, God told them to fast three days. Three times. So they fasted, fought, lost. Fasted, fought, lost. They fasted the third time, fought, and won. Well, why didn't God do it the first time? Because when we fast and pray, it's not changing God, folks. It's changing us. 
And some God, sometimes God says, wait, wait, because he is trying to shape us and change us and transform us by his word and by his grace. But we're so distracted, we miss out on a whole lot of things God might do because we just give up before the breakthrough comes. So next steps. Let me give you three next steps. I'm going to put out some, uh, I'll put out on email and also maybe our Facebook page uh, some passages concerning fasting in the Bible. I would encourage you just to open the book and read these passages about fasting. Because it's a personal decision, it's a voluntary decision. You need to read those passages for yourself. Secondly, you need to ask the Lord to teach you and give you wisdom as you consider the possibility of fasting. And if you do fast, follow Jesus' advice. Do it privately, do it purposely for spiritual reasons, and the Father who sees in secret will reward it openly. Why don't you stand with me this morning as we have a time of invitation. Father, help us to learn how to slow down and listen. And help us to wrestle with these difficult passages and Lord, it, when it unearths something in our own hearts and lives that uh, maybe is incomplete or not quite right, help us, Lord, not to run from that or to ignore it, but to deal with it. Lord, uh, we're just thankful for uh, Jesus and his willingness to come to this earth to live for us and die for us. Lord, help us to seek his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You respond as we sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me where he leads.